May we look to the Lord. When we studied in our conference yesterday, Luke 24, um, we did not mention all the things that have been opened in Luke 24. But there is one verse I would like to start with from the Old Testament, and it is in a very well-known psalm, the longest psalm of the Bible, Psalm 119, verse 130. Psalm 119, verse 130, where we read, The entrance of thy words gives light, giving understanding unto the simple. Uh, the word entrance can be translated opening. The opening of thy words gives light, giving understanding unto the simple. What I would like to do this morning with you is to look very briefly at, seven, at eight different verses where we see how things were opened up. Yesterday in Luke 24 we had an example of that in verse 32 that the scriptures were opened. Um, of course the word, the English word opening is used more times than eight in the New Testament. But the form this word has, this verb has in the Greek, with the preposition dia, that means a thorough opening up, a complete opening up. That, word, that root word is only found eight times, and I want to talk about those eight times. Now, a little anecdote. Uh, today, it is 16 years ago that my wife and I and our children came to Canada. And just before that time, we had uh, some home Bible studies in our area in Holland, and there was one brother uh, there, and he said, every time when we have a Bible study, it's like doors are being opened. And I thought of that later several times. This is exactly what happens with us when we enter into the Word. The Lord opens it up for us. And this is my prayer that through those eight verses, our understanding may open, our hearts may open wider for Him. Now, it is very remarkable that of these eight times, there are seven in Luke's writings. But the first reference is in Mark. So let's turn to Mark 7. Mark 7, verse 34, but I will read from verse 32. Mark 7, verse 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf, and had an impediment in his feet. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he, the Lord Jesus, sighed, and saith unto him, Ephata, that is, be opened. Now here the word, be opened, is the word that I'm talking about. And it's very appropriate that this is the first occurrence. And I'd like to make an application for us. Formerly, when we were sinners, enemies of God, we couldn't even hear. And we see in this uh, his, in this story, the action that was needed in order that we would be able to hear. What was needed? That the Lord would come down. That the Lord would put his hand upon us. We have seen in the studies on Friday how the Lord identified with the remnant. But here we see how the Lord identifies with a lost sinner. He put his hand upon him. And by the grace of God... All of us who are saved here, we can say, the Lord put his hand upon me. And I would say, if there is one here, or perhaps more, I don't know, God knows your heart, who is not saved yet, I would say, make yourself available that the Lord can put your, his hand upon you also. And what we see then, he took him aside from the multitude. I don't want to speak about all the details now here, but... What we see here, the Lord's ability. He put his fingers 
into his ears. And this word finger is what we have dactylo, that is where we have the word typing from. This is speaking about the ability the Lord has, the skill he has in his fingers. And the Lord used his skill to make us hear. A little story may help us to understand what this is. Um, there was an auction somewhere, I don't know where it was exactly, but there was <coughs> several things for sale in the auction. And uh, the master, the auction master, he presented one item of the list, and that was a violin. And he said, um, well, we start with $5. So who bids more, $10, 12 And then a man stood up in the audience and he said, could I just have that violin just for a second? And he adjusted the violin and he had some chords played on it. And all of a sudden, $10,000. People start to realize that's a very special violin. And I would say every human being is a very special instrument that God has created for himself. But through sin, the value has decreased a lot. But through the touch of the master's hand, this can change. And now, of course, we apply it, first of all, in connection with salvation. The touch of the master's hand is needed in order to be saved. But now for us as believers, we also need the touch of the master's hand that he can make us a useful instrument in his hands. And that would be the lesson for us. He would identify himself with us, put his fingers. You would say, well, that doesn't help. He can't even hear. Now it becomes even worse. But that shows how the Lord identified himself with the problem. If we have a problem, we go to the Lord, he identifies with that problem. But we need to be in touch with him. And then he spit. We would say that's a bit gross there. But that is really very intimate. It uh, expresses something of himself. He wants to share something of himself with this man. That is conveyed in this. And then he touched his tongue. There you see his ability. And then, it doesn't finish there, looking up to heaven. The Lord is a dependent servant here in Mark's Gospel. His resources come from God. And he sighed, perhaps impressed by the severity of the problem. And we may be in problems that are very severe. We sigh, but then we look up to have the resources from God. And he says, Ephata, that is Aramaic for be opened. So this is the first occurrence we find here. What needs to be opened first is the hearing. We know from Romans 10, the hearing, uh, faith comes through the hearing of the word of God. So if you can't hear, you're lost. You need to hear first. And then there is a follow-up. So if we turn to Luke 2 now, where we have the second uh, occurrence of this word, which relates to the coming of the Lord into this world. In Luke, you have many details about his coming into the world. And in Luke 2, we find, again, this word opening in a totally different setting. I'll just read Luke 2. Verse 22, 23. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Here we find the Lord Jesus in manhood. He came into this world, was born like every other baby. Yet there was this tremendous difference, and we talked about that also in our studies. The Lord was conceived from the Spirit. Luke 1 was that announced already. And so he is different from the beginning. He is God blessed over all. He is God the Son. We can't fathom this. Yet at the same time, he stooped down and he became man. And through this wonderful 
work of the Holy Spirit with Mary as we find in detail in Luke 1 and 2. But now the point here in verse 23 it is a quote from the Old Testament, from the law. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And you can read that in Exodus 13 in more detail. Uh, God has rights upon every newborn. And so here the Lord comes into this world and he would acknowledge the right that God has upon him as a human being. Just think about this. Every human being here is uh, subject to God's rights. But in our society, and even in our lives, we don't recognize God's rights. But this verse maintains this principle. Every uh, baby that was born, and now here of course it's a male, was specially set apart for God. And so we see then that in principle, every baby that was born in uh, Israel, a, a male, would be for God, for his service. And later that was limited, but I find this a very, very beautiful illustration now for us. The Lord was born here, but he represents a new generation. We have seen that also in our studies this week. The Lord was without sin. The Lord was, had not a human father as every one of us has. So the Lord was apart from sin. Here is a new beginning, a new generation. He is the firstborn of a new order. And so, in this new order, he is set apart for God. Now I apply it to you, to us as believers. The moment we were born again, God has set us apart for himself. We are holy in that sense. We don't have to wait for a number of years to be declared holy by someone. We are holy by the calling with, with which we have been called. God has set us apart. We are here for Him. We are, be, we are here for His interests. Now apply this in our daily uh, situations. Are we here in this world really devoted to God's interests? That is the wonderful example we find in the Lord Jesus. What a challenge, but also what an encouragement we find in him. The third occurrence we find, and now we turn to Luke 24, where we have three examples. But there are many more things that are opened in Luke 24. I just want to draw your attention to that. The tomb was opened, but the, this word that I'm referring to now is not used in that context. So we have the open and empty tomb. And that is the foundation. Everything depends on the open and empty tomb. 1 Corinthians 15 explains that. And it's remarkable that in the book of Acts, every discourse of the apostles, there is a reference to the, re to the resurrection. This day we are on a resurrection ground. We this is the first day of the week. That's the base on which we stand. So that's one thing that you could meditate upon. The tomb that was opened. We have read in Luke 2, the virgin tomb, the virgin womb. Here we have the virgin tomb. But the verse that I wanted to refer to now is the eyes in verse 31. Their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. So this is the third reference now where we have this opening. Now if you take the whole context, um, you should read at home quietly this story about the disciples of Emmaus. Um, when I was a teenager, and I, I was uh, really surprised how many times the brethren would speak about the two disciples from Emmaus. Why was that? Now, much later I understood. They were dis depressed. They were discouraged. But the Lord came in to help them. And that's exactly what we need so many times. We need the Lord to come in to encourage us. And that's what he does. But how does he encourage? What did he say in verse 26? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now the Lord didn't start there right away. He 
informed about their circumstances. He did not impose himself, but gradually the door was opened. They started to have confidence in him, and so he could speak now. And that is the verse that we have read. That is how the Lord came in into their lives, by speaking of himself, quoting the scriptures from Moses and the prophets and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So he referred to the whole Old Testament. What did they start to see now, those two disciples? Their hearts opened up. That would be another subject. Are our hearts really opened to embrace the Lord Jesus? To, yeah, to really embrace him, to say welcome to him in our hearts. It's good to see that all the scriptures speak of him. He is the key. Without him, you don't understand those writings of Moses, Moses chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 1, the Creator. You don't understand what Moses speaks about all these uh, details about the redemption from Egypt. But when you understand that the Lord Jesus is the key, that these things, we had the Passover lamb, Exodus 12. All these things, or we had the servant in Exodus 21 on Friday evening. All these things speak of him. So the Lord could draw their attention, not to their problems. What did he do? He drew their attention to the things concerning himself. And if there is anything that we need, it is this. That our attention, our heart are drawn to the Lord Jesus, to the things concerning himself. And that is how we should study the scriptures. Then they become so living, they become so vibrant, they become real. So that is how their eyes were opened. The Lord um, touched them how we don't know. Verse 31 says their eyes were opened. So while the scriptures are being presented to them, there is a work of God. Their eyes were opened. And that is exactly what we all need. That when we take up the scriptures, our eyes would be opened. There are Orthodox Jews who know the scriptures, the Old Testament by heart. Well, I have great respect for them. I don't know the scriptures by heart. But they lack this opening of the eyes. And when you see Saul of Tarsus, when he saw the Lord in the glory, everything changed. He knew the scriptures by heart, but he didn't know the one of whom the scriptures speak. And there he met him, and he understood the key was there. So the lock was opened. He had the lock of the Old Testament. All the scriptures were like a lock. He knew them, but they were still closed. 2 Corinthians 3 explains that in detail. There was a veil over him. But the Lord unlocks that lock. He takes away that veil. That is what happened here. The eyes were opened. And notice, they knew him. So they recognized him. There is a relationship now. And although he vanished out of their sight, he stayed in their hearts. Now this fourth occurrence is in verse 32. Immediately after, and there you see again the link with the scriptures... They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? So he opened the scriptures, as we have seen in verse 27. And that is what we need also. When we read the scriptures, even those difficult chapters in Leviticus, I remember when I was very young, I started to read the scriptures, very enthusiastic, but when I got at Leviticus, I, I just stopped. And I hear that often, But then I would say, yeah, that is where we need the Lord's help so that we understand more of him, even in those scriptures. And even if you don't understand, read on. I remember when I started to read Romans, I didn't understand much. Almost nothing. But you need to read on and on, and you have to re-read all the time. And then gradually the Holy Spirit can open up the scriptures. That is what we need. By the way, they opened their house for the Lord Jesus. They had received him. So that's another thought you can follow. They had opened the house and he became the host. He became the master of the house. As you see in verse 30, he took the bread and he blessed it and break and gave it to them. It's wonderful when the Lord receives his rightful place in our home. Does he have the rightful place in our house, in our home? That he would be the boss. 
when young people get a driver's license, they are very glad they can go on their own. But consider this. In your mind, give the key to the Lord. Make him the boss of the car. And so make him the master of the house. That's what these disciples did. And then there's a follow-up. And that's what we saw yesterday afternoon in verse 45. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So there are three things. I just repeat them briefly. He opened their eyes. So they recognized him. He opened the scriptures so that they understood the scriptures, that they spoke of him. And here is a further development, a further step. He opened their understanding. Now, this is what we need as well. Um, It is not sufficient to understand the scriptures in an intellectual way. We need that further touch, as it were. We need this opening of the understanding. And that is what we had in John 6 about appropriation, the difficult word, you remember, to make it your own. That goes together with this thought of opening the understanding. Through that process, you make these things your own. And again, that is, the two go together. You do the effort. We do the effort. We read the scriptures, we meditate, we study, take concordance. And then at the same time, there is this work of God. He opened their understanding. That is what we need. It's beautiful to see how God works together. There is a work of God. And that is what we need to make these things our own. That is this eating what we talked about in John 6. By the way, John 6 is such a wonderful chapter to read and reread. Now we turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 56. It's wonderful to see that in Luke we have the presentation of the Lord. But in Acts you find a company formed after the example of the Lord. Formed after his model. And in Acts 7 you find the prototype of a Christian. He is a martyr. We have talked about it this week also. The testimony in this world is a suffering testimony. Like martyr. Witness martyr. That is Stephen. But the verse I want to read now is Acts 7, verse 56. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Here is the word, again, that same word, opened. Thoroughly opened. Opened up. Now compare this with what we had in Matthew 3. At the beginning of our studies, the heavens were opened upon the Lord. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. There he was the object of heaven. The heaven looked down upon him. But here it is the other way around. Here there is a disciple on this earth. But the heaven are open for him. And he looks into the heavens and he sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So again the Lord Jesus is the object. But not the object on the earth. He is now the object in heaven. And what we find here in verse 56 is really a wonderful summary of the whole epistle of the Hebrews. Hebrews speaks about the open heaven. Hebrews speaks about the Son of Man at God's right hand. It's wonderful to study that. Here you have it already. And so Stephen is in the good of the truth of Hebrews. Are we in the good of the truth of Hebrews? Do we? Appreciate the privilege we have. Open heaven. Free access before the throne of grace. We can come with our requests. But not only that. We come with our praise and worship. Because we see the one who is crowned with glory and honor. Here he stands. Some say in order to sit down. He just entered heaven. He was saluted by God. Hebrews 5 says that. Greeted by God. I imagine the whole multitude of angels have acclaimed praise to him when he entered the heavens. But he was going to sit down. Here perhaps he stands waiting if the nation perhaps would change their mind so that he could come back. But anyway, he is here the Son of Man at the right hand of God. And Stephen sees him. The heavens were opened to him. And this is 
our privilege, beloved. You read 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We all contemplate the glories of the Lord. And we are transformed from glory to glory. That is an example that fits in with this verse. Now the next verse I want to read, we're almost at the end, in Acts 16. Verse 14. Acts 16, verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. This is a wonderful example of a work of God. This lady was very much interested. She was a Gentile. She was very much interested in the God of Israel. So she had joined those faithful Jews there in verse 13 who came on the Sabbath. Uh, by the riverside they had not a synagogue there were not enough men in order to have a synagogue they needed ten Jewish men they were not there obviously and so they would come together at the riverside for prayer and sit down but there is where the Holy Spirit had sent Paul the Apostle Paul and his company and so while Paul is speaking there and Luke was there also, but he records it. He was with them at that moment. The Holy Spirit records this for us. It's a very wonderful lesson. Lydia, the name has to do with um, uh, something with, which is uh, grievous, something which is not pleasant, which is painful. That is the origin of man. Even a birth in itself is a painful matter. And so here we have an indication of where man is painful in existence but she had an interest for God uh, the verse in King James says she worshipped God would uh, imply that she would have great interest in the at that moment that was the Jewish religion still but she would have a great interest in the God of Israel but that is as it were the beginning where God takes over now so she has an interest and now God comes in who opens the heart whose heart the Lord opened from the heart are the issues of life the heart is the real center of our being and so when the heart is opened for God that's a good start and you can follow uh, later in this chapter you see how the house was opened her house was opened for the gospel. Her house was opened for this company of Paul and the believers there. And probably the early assembly there. So there again you find an open house. But it starts here with the heart that was opened. Now one more example. And then I want to turn back to Luke 24. Uh, Acts 17. Where Paul continued his journey. And now he is in Thessalonica. And he was in the, he, he spoke with the Jews every Sabbath in the synagogue. And what did he do in verse 3? Opening and setting before them that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. What's Paul doing here? He's doing exactly the same thing that the Lord did in Luke 24 with the disciples from Emmaus he uses the scriptures opening them so what do we see here now we find a Christian who is opening the scriptures to his fellow Jews not believers yet and he opens the scriptures and presents to them the Christ and explains to them that he must suffer just the same word as we had in Luke 24 and this Jesus whom I preach the word preach here announce whom I present to you is Christ, Messiah. This is wonderful to see how 
Paul was in the school of God and he followed the example of his master. Now I'd like to turn back to Luke 24. We have seen now these eight different occurrences of this word opening or open up. There are many more words in the English with open. I forgot that, but in connection with Paul's ministry that we just had in Acts uh, 17, I want to read, uh, I apologize for that confusion, but just read in Acts 26, where we find a summary of Paul's ministry. So what we find with Paul's ministry, as we had in Acts 17, he opened up. That was his ministry. And in Acts 26, we see this. He's serving in the temple, but they all, the people is outside. What does that mean? The entrance is closed. And even the entrance for the high priest was closed. Hebrews explains that in detail. Only once a year he could enter, not without blood. And it was the blood of a sacrifice. Now the entrance is open, wide open, and they have this free access. This is our privilege, beloved. Through these openings, we have now free access. The heavens are opened, and we can come with open mouths. Here we see the mouth is open in praise and blessing. Often our mouths are shut. No, here they are open. Why? They well forth. There is so much in the heart, an abundance. So they cannot stop. They must flow out in praise and worship. And that is what we see here. That is the response to this opening up. The opening of the mouth in worship and praise. <coughs> May the Lord help us to do this. And to be more at his feet to learn. And also to be worshippers. We will be worshippers forever in heaven. I would say that Bible study will continue we will see new treasures in the Word. And so, the worship will continue forever. May the Lord help us.